Okay, so we're going to begin talking about coronary artery disease. We see a picture here of Homer Simpson eating a big, greasy, meaty cheeseburger. Coronary artery disease is abbreviated as capital C-A-D, and it is a specific type of vessel disease. We're talking about the deposition of fat, um, fat of inside the coronary arteries. Now this de deposition of fat initially begins off as soft fat, but over time and as we age, this fat will harden. And of course, you can see that it's going to um, interfere with perfusion and the flow of blood to the cardiac muscle itself. Now, etiology refers to the cause. What is the cause of coronary artery disease? It is atherosclerosis. This is very important that you commit that to memory because you need to understand that the major cause, what causes this in our patients and in ourselves perhaps, is the formation of atherosclerosis, which we see highlighted in this picture here. This is all of that fat that has accumulated inside the lumen of a coronary artery, reducing the size of the diameter of that lumen. Okay, so we have cholesterol and lipids forming within the intimal layer of the coronary artery. So that is the cause, atherosclerosis. Now, what initiates the development of this atherosclerosis? Quite frequently, it is hypertension. Remember, hypertension is that increased pressure as the blood flows against the arterial walls. Okay, so that can actually cause micro damage to the intimal lining, starting that process of atherosclerosis or the deposition of fats and cholesterol there. Also, high uh, levels of fats within our serum also cause the deposition of the fats there. So we have high cholesterol, high fats within the bloodstream that also um, start the initiation and uh, start the process of atherosclerosis leading to coronary artery disease. Certainly other chemical injuries as well can act as irritants causing endothelial injury leading to atherosclerosis. And we can think of some irritants, um, a certain IV drugs that can especially be irritating to the intimal lining. Also high shear stress. Um, certainly if we pass any type of catheter or guide wire through the arteries, that can lead to stress um, and development of injury there. When you have injury from any of these sources, whether it's high blood pressure, chemical irritants, or the mechanical irritation of a catheter, this then brings platelets to that site. And, and platelets at the site are activated. That means they become very sticky trying to um, repair the site of injury. You've seen this slide before, but we have to mention it here in terms of coronary artery disease. Collateral circulation occurs over time. That's that additional arterial branching um, when there is an occlusion to a coronary artery. So you can see how atherosclerosis can be blocking the flow of blood. And then the person's going to respond by growing this additional branching 
to provide blood flow to those areas that aren't getting it. Again, this is mostly associated with older people because they've had decades to develop this collateral circulation. Okay, let's look at who is most likely to have risk factors for developing coronary artery disease. We're going to begin with the non-modifiable risk factors. Again, these are things that we cannot change and they include age. So we start to see more coronary artery disease associated with middle-aged people. Certainly gender, we see coronary artery disease mostly in men versus women, at least up until the age of 60. I do want to caution you again that these are risk factors. Certainly there are plenty of women, even under the age of 60, that have coronary artery disease. It's just stating that men have a higher risk of it. And then we see the same thing with race. We see a risk factor more associated or increased risk associated with our African-American patients than white patients. However, that does not exclude our uh, Caucasian patients of having coronary artery disease. So I just want to make that distinction. And now certainly there is a genetic predisposition um, which increases a person's risk of developing coronary artery disease if they have a family history of it. Now, as health professionals, we would like to focus on the modifiable risk factors because there's not much we can do with the unmodifiable risk factors. So let's look at some of these for coronary artery disease. We see high serum lipids. So that's why we like to do those screening tests and get those serum lipid levels monitored because if they are high, that means that individual has an increased risk of developing coronary artery disease. Certainly if they have hypertension, that's part of their personal health history, then they are at increased risk of coronary artery disease. And we already explained why that is a risk factor in our, uh, when we talked about the etiology of coronary artery disease. Smoking as well is a very significant risk factor for coronary artery disease and diabetes. So we're going to talk a lot more about diabetes being a very strong risk factor for coronary artery disease, obesity, sedentary lifestyle, and stress. Okay, so I just would like to mod, uh, add one little thing here, and that's about the diet as far as their diet goes. Um, in general, for our coronary artery disease, a low-fat, low-cholesterol diet is prescribed for patients with coronary artery disease, especially if this is leading to angina, okay, which is that we'll talk about shortly in this lecture. Understand that most fruits and vegetables are low in fat and cholesterol. Um, they are cholesterol free, and so it is a very good part of a diet for these people who are at risk of coronary artery disease. And just kind of an aside, but Jello is also um, one of those foods that could be on a low fat and low cholesterol diet because Jell-O also has no fat or cholesterol. And you can see from this picture, um, ice cream and dairy foods like this, that they're high in cholesterol and fat. So they should be uh, eliminated from the diet or at least minimized. Okay, so elevated serum lipids are a major risk factor for coronary artery disease. Okay. 
In particular, we see a total serum cholesterol level that's greater than 200 milligrams per deciliter is a risk factor for coronary artery disease. Once again, we study oh, the liver and the function of the liver. There is another very important function of the liver. Besides synthesizing clotting factors, it is also responsible for producing cholesterol. Um, let's also talk about the triglycerides in the bloodstream. Triglycerides are your fats. And when a person gets a fasting triglyceride level, we do not want it greater than 150 milligrams per deciliter. When the triglyceride levels are elevated, um, then this will lead to coronary artery disease. And oftentimes triglycerides are elevated because of the person's lifestyle. Do they have a sedentary lifestyle? Do they um, not exercise often? Does their work mean sitting behind a desk, driving to work, making these commutes? Are they sitting an hour in the car and an hour on the way home? And also weight um, in terms of being obese or carrying too much weight will also elevate their triglyceride levels and increase their risk of developing coronary artery disease. Um, triglycerides, uh, just as an aside, must be combined with proteins to be transported in the bloodstream. Okay, so here we see Homer again, um, very comfortable on the couch, he's a couch potato with the remote in his hand, uh, promoting a sedentary lifestyle. So I wanted to provide you with some normal levels of cholesterols in the bloodstream. This is what we would like to see. These are the desirable levels, or perhaps from the side of the provider, these are the goals that they are trying to achieve in their patients. First, with the total cholesterol, it's going to be, as we said in the previous slide, less than 200. Now, within the cholesterol, if we subdivide it, there are components that are good and bad within that total cholesterol. And I'm going to go into detail about that in a few minutes. But as in terms of this slide, uh, the LDL, the low density lipoproteins, we want to be less than 100 milligrams per deciliter. And the good cholesterol, the high density lipoproteins, we want to be 40 milligrams per deciliter or higher. The higher, the better when it comes to the good cholesterol. So not only do we look at total cholesterol, but we look at the components that make up that total cholesterol. We want the bad cholesterol to be low and the good cholesterol to be high. And then finally, we have that other component of um, in the serum that we look at, and that's our fats or triglycerides. Uh, for adults, we would like that level to be less than 150 milligrams per deciliter. Now, I have placed a video regarding this slide in your resources so that if you want a little better explanation, it is provided there for you. When our patients or when individuals have high serum lipids and triglycerides, we refer to that as that condition as hyperlipidemia, hyper high lipids in the blood emia. Okay, so hyperlipidemia. If we look closer at those fats that are in the bloodstream, we'll be able to categorize them, especially based on their density. How heavy are they? The heavier ones contain more protein than triglycerides. Okay, The lighter ones contain more triglycerides or fats than proteins. In other words, proteins are heavier than fat. Okay, So if we spun down or in a centrifuge, our blood 
it would um, spin out so that the heaviest lipoproteins are on the bottom of the test tube and the lighter ones are up toward the top. So that is how we have come to these names that we're going to talk about here. The largest lipoprotein particles in the bloodstream are the chylomicrons. These are substances secreted by the intestinal mucosa into the portal circulation when lipids are absorbed from a fat-containing meal. So when you eat a Krispy Kreme donut, that's my example of a fat-containing meal, it's going to be absorbed through the intestinal mucosa into that portal circulation. The lipoproteins contain the highest proportion of lipids and the, they tend to be the least dense of the lipoproteins. Okay. So let's talk about the VLDL component, the very light density lipids, very low density lipoproteins. They have a high proportion of triglycerides or fat or lipids. Okay, then we look at the LDLs. These stand for the low density lipoproteins. And they have um, a, again, a low uh, amount of protein and a higher concentration of fats. The HDL are the high density lipoproteins and they have a lot of protein and very little fat or triglycerides, okay? So they are all um, fats within the bloodstream, but we're just categorizing them by the amount of fat they have compared to the lipoprotein, uh, um, the proteins that are there. Now, I just want to mention something else that's very important here. I have a note in my um, that I wrote down to make sure to tell the students this. So you might want to add this to your slide. VLDL, your very low density lipoproteins, and your LDL, the low density lipoproteins, play the most important roles in promoting atherosclerosis, okay? Um, so the VLDL and the LDL promote atherosclerosis. So I made up this little slide to show you that the LDL is the bad guy here carrying the devil's fork um, because it does promote the buildup of plaque and atherosclerosis in those coronary arteries. And I have a picture of HDL, the high density lipoprotein, as the good guy with the halo and the angel's wings. Okay, so we often refer to HDLs as good cholesterol because really they do not promote atherosclerosis as does the LDL component. Most of the body's cholesterol is manufactured in the liver. About 85% of your blood cholesterol level is endogenous, which means it is produced by your own body. The other 15 to 25% or so comes from an external source, that is your diet. Your dietary cholesterol originates from foods like meat, poultry, fish, seafood, especially uh, shellfish, shrimp, crab, lobster. They're very high in cholesterol and also dairy products. It's possible for some people to eat foods that are high in cholesterol and still have low blood cholesterol levels. 
Likewise, it's possible to eat foods that are low in cholesterol and have a high blood cholesterol level. Bad cholesterol is the LDL, the major cholesterol carrier in the blood. And this picture, you see it in red. Now, good cholesterol is the HDL. And we, it's a greater level of HDL. We think of this as a drain cleaner that you pour in the sink, as we said earlier. It's thought to provide some protection against artery blockage. Okay, and the way that it does that is by carrying lipids and fat away from the coronary arteries. There, it takes it back to the liver where the liver breaks down the cholesterol and excretes it from the body. Okay, in this diagram, uh, we see a yellow dot and that represents cholesterol. Uh, it is, and by the way, you might be asking, why does the liver make cholesterol if it's so bad? Well, cholesterol is an essential steroid, and it has to be um, made because it is a precursor to making all of our steroid hormones. And we know that the blood levels of cholesterol are regulated by the liver. If a uh, cholesterol is absent from the diet, then the liver will synthesize it from fatty acids, which we see in this picture as red squares. If blood levels of cholesterol are excessive, then the liver will secrete it into the bile, which it then delivers to the small intestines and is eliminated from your body within the feces. Because cholesterol is a lipid, it does not dissolve in the aqueous fluid of the blood, the liquid portion of the blood, the water base. Cholesterol is transported in the blood at bound to lipoproteins. Then they are soluble in the blood. LDLs carry cholesterol from the liver to the cells. HDLs carry cholesterol from the cells to the liver for excretion. So high levels of LDL correlate with a higher incidence of atherosclerosis. This may be because the liver is sending too much cholesterol out into the body. Thus, LDL is considered the bad, bad cholesterol. Excuse me. <clears throat> high levels of HDL are correlated with a lower incidence of atherosclerosis. This may be because HDLs function to send cholesterol back to the liver for excretion, effectively lowering blood cholesterol. Thus, HDL is considered the good cholesterol. Hmm. Now let's talk about factors that will increase the risk of developing coronary artery disease. First up on that list is hypertension. And as we already talked about hypertension, you know everything there's to know about hypertension now. So understand that hypertension is a big risk factor for CAD. When blood pressure is greater than 140 over 90, that is our definition of hypertension, and it is closely correlated with coronary artery disease. So while we cannot eliminate a personal history of high blood pressures, we can certainly manage or control a patient's hypertension through diet, exercise, we said all the modifications to lifestyle, and if that alone doesn't do it, then we will use drug therapy or our antihypertensives to achieve that end. Cigarette smoking is another risk factor for developing coronary artery disease. In fact, we have some statistics that indicate that 
the risk is increased up to six times higher for developing coronary artery disease if you are a smoker. The more you smoke, the more likely you are to develop coronary artery disease. So there's definitely a proportional um, relationship between the amount somebody smokes and their risk of developing coronary artery disease. Now, what's very important to know is that if they stop smoking, if a person stops smoking, they will alter their risk. It won't be immediate, but it certainly will reduce their risk. So sometimes you'll hear patients say, well, I've been smoking for 20 years. I don't see any point in quitting now. Well, that's not true. There is a point to quitting even now because it will eventually decrease their risk over the long run of developing coronary artery disease. Okay, and now another factor that we're gonna look at for increasing the risk of coronary artery disease is obesity. And we define obesity as being 30% or more over uh, your ideal body weight, okay? Um, uh, also associated with obesity is a greater mortality rate from coronary artery disease. By itself, if an individual was only obese and did not have hypertension or um, did not smoke, uh, then their risk is not that terrible. But when you combine obesity with risk factors like hypertension, it increases their risk quite a bit okay so and and the truth is most people who are obese do have some other comorbidities such as hypertension so when a person is obese it does increase their heart size and it also increases their oxygen demand okay so those are additional stressors that are placed on the body Now, another risk factor for coronary artery disease is a sedentary lifestyle. And this means basically that there is not an inclusion of exercise on a regular basis in their life. What do we mean by regular basis? Well, that's defined as exercising three times a week for 30 minutes or more, okay? Um, we want the level of exercise to produce a, a sweat if you aren't sweating, then it's really not much of, of much benefit at all. Okay, we want to increase the heart rate by 30 to 50 beats per minute to be considered um, beneficial. We have definitely shown that individuals who have jobs that are more active and require physical labor or movement, that they will have less coronary artery disease. And we certainly have to mention stress and um, stressful lifestyles. They can contribute to coronary artery disease. And we like to talk about personalities and stress level in terms of somebody's behavior, whether they're a type A or type B um, behavior that they have. Okay, so mostly it's, coronary artery disease would be associated with our type A individuals. These are people who tend to be more um, time oriented. They tend to be more competitive, more perfectionist. They can be more seen as being more aggressive or intense or passionate or irritable. Um, then we see it with our type B individuals who are more relaxed, laid back, um, don't seem to get rattled by things very easily. Okay, so type A individuals are more prone to developing a heart attacks than our type B individuals. And if you ever work on a cardiac floor, you will completely understand this statement. You'll notice that 
there is a personality associated with our uh, cardiac patients. And this is a huge one. This will increase risk of coronary artery disease, having a comorbidity such as diabetes. It is considered a major risk factor. So what we want to do is stress the importance of uh, adhering to their diet and also managing or controlling their blood sugar levels. Okay. Uh, now this goal is just a nice goal. There are, you may have heard of other goals for hemoglobin A1C levels because it really is uh, dependent on the individual's condition. Okay, so what might be a goal for one person with diabetes may not be the exact same goal that their doctor gave them because of other comorbidities they have. But in general, we would like to say that the hemoglobin A1C level uh, less than six is desirable to help the prevention of a coronary artery disease to prevent our patients from developing that. Exercise also, it would be important for our diabetic patients to help prevent the development of coronary artery disease. Now, as nurses and nursing students who are learning to be nurses, we are going to focus on pharmacological agents used to treat hyperlipidemia. In other words, what drugs are we going to use to lower our patient's lipid levels? First, let's talk, remind ourselves that there are several steps that can be taken to reduce cholesterol levels. And the first is to eat a low fat, low cholesterol diet. So what that means is keeping your total fat consumption um, to fewer than 30% of your daily intakes of calories, all right? So fat consumption, there's lots of fats, right? There's saturated, there's polyunsaturated, and there's monounsaturated. So all of those fats we want to keep low. What are saturated fats? Well, those are the fats that are contained in butter and whole milk and shortening and things like that. So we need to also limit our um, consumption of meats, especially beef, pork, liver, and, and tongue, things like that. Always trim away excess fat. In addition, through diet, we can avoid cheeses and fried foods. Also cream, um, use skim milk instead of um, heavy milk, um, and also um, fried, we said fried foods already. Nuts, also, I didn't mention nuts. Okay. Instead, that we, we want to make sure our patients eat a variety of vegetables, grains, and fruits. All right. So, sometimes positive changes in diet, lifestyle, and exercise are not enough. Okay. In these cases, we're going to use medication to lower cholesterol. Um, and that decision is going to be made based on the, H, the high levels of LDL cholesterol and other factors for cardiovascular disease. So several drugs have been shown to reduce the plasma levels of the various lipoproteins, particularly cholesterol. Well, standards were established to decrease the rate of coronary artery disease secondary to hyperlipidemia. And this is heart disease. In case you all were wondering how this fits in, a coronary artery disease sometimes is referred to as heart disease. And this is what we want to prevent. Uh, the risk for coronary heart disease is three times greater if the total cholesterol level is at or above 260 milligrams per deciliter compared to a person with a level of 200 milligrams per deciliter or lower. 
So you see there is a direct benefit to that 200 milligram per deciliter mark. We want it to be that or lower. As it increases, it becomes an increased risk for that patient to develop heart disease. There are four different classifications of hyperlipidemics or medications that lower fat, cholesterol, and lipids within the bloodstream. Okay, they are listed here, the fibric acid derivatives, the HMG-CoA reductase inhibitors, uh, often referred to as statins, and niacin or nicotinic acid, that's the same thing, and finally, the fourth category would be our bile acid sequestrants. Now, it's going to be important for you to review these drugs that are used in the treatment of hyperlipidemia. I am going to review some important points, but it's up to you to understand the dosing and side effects of these drugs. Yes, it will be covered on your exam. Okay, so now look at the picture here, the diagram. You see coronary artery disease. That's the yellow um, in this picture that is the demonstrates or represents the buildup of plaque within the intimal lining of the coronary arteries. Okay, that is heart disease um, and that we want to make sure we prevent that sometimes with medications. Because if not, they're gonna have problem with blood flow, an alteration in perfusion, and the tissue distal to the obstruction will not be receiving adequate oxygenation, it will become ischemic and perhaps necrotic, which would be your heart attack. So the first category we'll talk about is the fibric acid derivatives, okay? Sometimes this is also referred to as fibrates category. So know that fibrates and fibric acid are the same thing. What these medications do is reduce the synthesis of triglycerides in the liver. Okay, specifically, it's going to decrease those bad cholesterols, VLDL and LDL. And it's going to increase the good cholesterol, which is your HDL. At the bottom of the slide, we have a couple um, examples of medications that fit into this category of fibrates. And the first one is Lopid. The name itself, if you broke it apart, would sound like low, lower, PID, a low PID like lipids. So we're gonna lower the lipids within the bloodstream. The generic form, um, the generic name of that medication is Gemfibrozil. And then we also have another example called Tricor. And again, if you broke the name apart, you would have Tri for triglycerides and Cor for coronary, which refers to the heart. So we're going to lower triglycerides that lend themselves to coronary artery disease. The, another generic word for this Tricor medication is phenofibrate. So we'll do see that phenofibrate quite a bit in the hospital as well. Both of those, gemfibrozil and phenofibrate. Now let's talk a little bit about the side effects of these medications. In general, these medications cause GI disturbances. Remember, these are side effects. Does everybody get GI disturbances? No. Do some people? Yes. How bothersome are they? I don't know. We would have to ask the patient. Um, and we would, we would check up and find out if they're having side effects from the medication if it was newly started. Uh, they may be annoying, they may be not able to tolerate it, so we would have to find out. For example, if it um, makes the patient nauseous, well, are we going to stop taking this medication because of the nausea? Or is it more important that we um, prevent them from developing coronary artery disease. Well, so there's some things that we can suggest if a medication makes a patient nauseous. In general, this is all the way through nursing for the most part. If something makes them nauseous, we suggest that they take it with food or 
take it at night so that when they fall asleep, they won't feel the nausea. Another thing is if they continue to take the medication for a number of weeks, sometimes these side effects resolve all by themselves. Um, so they can, those side effects can go away. So listed under GI disturbances, we have all those things like nausea, flatulence, bloating, diarrhea. I'm not saying they're gonna get it, I'm just saying it's possible. Another big thing that we monitor for is that these medications, these antihyperlipidemics can cause changes in the liver. Okay, so if there is damage to the liver because of a medication we're giving, yes, we would want to discontinue it. But how would we monitor for liver changes? Okay, hopefully you're thinking about liver enzymes because when we do monitor these patients for their liver enzymes, in particular the AST and ALT, if they become elevated, then we would want to um, follow that patient and see if it is the medication that's causing the liver elevation uh, in those liver enzymes. But the good thing about this is that if there is any problem with any particular classification of antihyperlipidemic, we have lots of other choices to choose from. So if it is a problem, the patient cannot tolerate it for whatever reason, we have other medications at our disposal. Okay, the next classification we'll talk about are, is our niacin. Um, that is also vitamin B3. Um, also referred to as nicotinic acid. So if you can hear any of three of those words, niacin, vitamin B3, or nicotinic acid, they all refer to the same um, medication here. Now you're saying, oh, I can buy vitamin B3 over the counter. Well, you can. However, what the vitamin B3 that is prescribed to lower serum lipid levels is a much higher dose than that which you buy over the counter. Okay, so it is higher dose. How it works, it decreases triglycerides. It also increases the good cholesterol, HDL. And it is one of the least expensive medications in this category and it still is effective. So it's a good category that it also can be used and sometimes used in combination with other you know, antilipidemic medications to lower lipid levels. Now the side effects of our niacin are different. So I want to spell these out here for you. Um, one of them is that it causes vasodilation and because of that vasodilation, if you think about peripheral vasodilation, more of the blood's going to be out there, less is returning to the right side of the heart, less is being, uh, we have a decreased cardiac output and we have a lower blood pressure. So it does result in hypotension at these high doses in some people. Um, it can also cause GI upset, but again, if that's a problem, we can have them patient take it with food and that will usually uh, get rid of that upset stomach and and then it will also dissipate in a few weeks but what it, they like to test you on is especially what i have listed here we have this puritis we have this itching that occurs because of all of that vasodilation okay and we have flushing because of that vasodilation. So to reduce the flushing, it was very uncomfortable feeling for the patient. Flushing can be anywhere on the body. It's not just the cheeks, okay? It can be all over the thighs. I've seen it uh, anywhere um, when they take high dose vitamin B3. And what we tell them to do then is to take um, aspirin along with their niacin. It can just be a baby aspirin, okay? Or we can actually have them take an antihistamine uh, along with their niacin uh, for a couple of weeks until this flushing effect um, dissipates, I should say. 
until they build up that tolerance to the niacin. Okay, so we like to test you on the fact that a patient can take aspirin or antihistamine for a couple of weeks along with the niacin to reduce that flushing effect. Um, the B vitamin niacin in high doses can lower the triglycerides and the LDLs as well, the bad cholesterol, and increase the good cholesterol. It has been proven to reduce a person's risk of having a second heart attack. Okay, So it's much better that we address these little pesky side effects um, instead of having them not take their niacin. Now, the next category is the bile acid sequestrants. And we have some examples here of drugs um, that fall into this category. We have Questran, Cholestid, and Wellcall. And you see their generic names next to them. Um, I just want you to recognize them as being bile acid sequestrants so that you understand when you're administering them to your patients what you are giving the patient and what is the action of them and what are the um, ways in which you should administer it. Okay, so how these medications work, that their action takes place in the GI tract. Okay, that's why I have a big stomach here to remind you that the bile acid sequestrants work in the stomach and then in the GI tract. These are not absorbed, so they do not have a systemic impact on the patient. Okay. These medications are not absorbed into the bloodstream. They have their action within the GI tract. They can still have GI disturbances, such as we listed with the other medications. Yeah, they can all cause GI disturbances like indigestion, constipation, bloating, whatever. So we're going to go into a little bit more detail here with those bile acid sequestrants so that you understand their mechanism of action. Okay, in general, normal physiology, we need bile acids for absorption of cholesterol. Okay, our cholesterol that comes in through the diet is not going to be absorbed without having bile available. Well, these medications, bile acid sequestrants, combine with the bile acids and form an insoluble complex. Okay? Therefore, the cholesterol is not absorbed into the bloodstream. Okay? So the result is that it prevents the reabsorption of bile acids from the small intestines. Okay, so bile acids, sequestrants, bind with bile acids in the intestine, forming an insoluble complex and are, is excreted in the feces. Binding results in removal of LDL, the bad cholesterol, um, along with uh, that medication in the feces. And I'm going into this detail because you are expected to understand the mechanism of actions. Nursing will test you on these type of things, the various mechanisms of actions of these medications. So when we administer bile acid sequestrants to our patients, let's make sure we understand that it comes in a dry powder. Okay? That means it has to be mixed with liquids and if the patient is not able to have liquids, then we need to have very soft foods that contain a lot of liquid. Okay. Another thing they'll test you on with this bile acid sequestrants is the fact that they like to bind to many drugs. We use it to bind to cholesterol, right? Or excuse me, to bile acids so that we can't absorb cholesterol. But these medications also bind to many drugs that a patient may be taking. So what are we going to do in that case? We don't want to lower the therapeutic effect of other medications the patient is taking. 
So we might advise them to take this medication, the bile acid sequestrant, before or after their other medications. So if we can separate the time by a, a couple hours or two, you know, an hour or two, that would be great. That would decrease the amount of binding that occurs that we between the bile acid sequestrant and other medications the patient takes. So these two things they will test you on here. So put a star by it. Okay? They need to take it with lots of liquids and they want to put, you know, schedule it before or after their other medications because it loves to bind to them. And if it binds to those other medications, those other medications will not be therapeutic or beneficial for the patient. Now, when they take it properly, it will decrease the patient's triglyceride levels and it will increase the good cholesterol, uh, sometimes by as much as 